Up to this point, we have been dealing with the mechanics of rigid bodies, and what I'd like to start to do now is to move on to the concept of deformal bodies, and we'll see that this will allow us to solve a much wider class of problems. And before really getting into it too much, I'd like to introduce the concept of, inter of an internal force diagram. So suppose I have a bar that's been subjected to two loads, five pounds and 10 pounds. Now, if we treat the system as a rigid body, then I could just combine the two forces, 5 and 10, into an equivalent force of 15 pounds applied on the end of the bar or in the middle of the bar. It doesn't really matter as long as I keep the line of action the same. Now, when you're dealing with deformable bodies, this actually turns out not to be correct in terms of, say, getting the exact same behavior out of the system. So what we have here right now is if I put a 5-pound force and I put a 10 pound force onto the system. If it's rigid, it's the same as putting a 15 pound force onto the system. Now, if the body is deformable, then things are going to be a little different. So let's consider our body with a 5 and a, a 10 pound force on it. And I want to examine what the forces are inside the bar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a section cut, say, between the 5 pound force and the 10 pound force. And if I make a section cut there, there is some set of forces and moments in general that act across that section cut. Now, because I'm just applying a force, I'm going to be able to represent strictly by a single force. And I'll call that R. And so R stands for resultant force or internal resultant. And it happens to be equal to 10. In fact, if we put the units on here, it's 10 pounds and 10 pounds. Okay. Now, if I decide to make the section cut on the other side of the 5 pound force, I'll have my 10 pound force here, I'll have my 5 pound force, and I'll have the resultant, and that resultant for equilibrium is going to have to be equal to 15 pounds. So notice that the resultant at the first section cut was 10 pounds, and the resultant at the section, second section cut was 15 pounds. So the internal resultant inside my body is changing depending on position. Okay, so what I can do is I'm, I can make something known as an internal force diagram. So I go ahead and define the x-coordinate here as zero at the wall where I built the bar in. And if I make section cuts at various values of x, then I can draw this graph for r of x, which is my internal force, as a function of x. And you can see it starts out at 15 at the wall. When I hit the 5 pound force, it jumps down and then it's equal to 10 going out across. So this is known as internal force diagram. And you can see how the, how the forces are changing. And if the body is deformable, this actually makes a difference in how the body responds to the loads. So there's a sign convention that you should pay attention to here. And that is when the internal force is positive, then the material is in tension, and if the internal force is negative, then the material is in compression. And the way to get this to always work out consistently is that we say that a force in the outward normal direction to a suction cut is considered positive. So if I look at my suction cuts over here, say this one, I had my 10 pound force, and the outward unit normal, I'll just call it N, on the suction cut points off to the left. So when I draw the internal force on this section cut here in that same direction, if it's in that direction, it's going to be positive. Okay, so the, that's, that's the sign convention. And what we do normally is when we make our free body diagrams, we always draw the unknown forces in the system in the positive direction. Then we let the signs take care of they come out to be whatever they need to be, and if they come out to be positive, then we know the system is in tension. If they come out to be negative, we know that the system is in compression. Okay, so deformable bodies. The, the other main thing about deformable bodies is, is that they deform. So if I pull on a body, it's going to change its dimensions. That's what we mean by deformability. And Deformability is intimately tied to these internal forces and how they vary from position to position. Uh, accounting for deformability is really going to allow us to solve a much wider variety of problems. For example, we'll be able to solve for 
the behavior of indeterminate problems. Before, with the, the statics that we were reviewing, whenever we had an indeterminate problem, well, it was just simply a problem that we couldn't solve. Okay, so when we account for deformability, that will allow us to be able to, to answer those types of questions, in addition to a, a much wider variety of questions. So, for instance, we'll be able to talk about failure of bodies and things of that nature. Uh, when we deal with deformable problems, we will still need to deal with the concepts of equilibrium. So those are quite similar to what we had before, but we will have to make them a bit more sophisticated. Uh, we'll have to deal with notions of kinematics. So kinematics is the science of motion. So because it's deformable, it moves. And the other thing that's going to become very important is the notion of constitution. So these are the questions of what any type of mechanical system is constituted out of. So is it made out of steel? Is it made out of jello, plastic? And, and whatnot. All those types of materials have very different uh, mechanical responses and when you deal with deformable bodies you have to consider that fact also. So when we, we formulate problems in deformable mechanics we'll see that we'll always have equilibrium concepts, we'll always have kinematic concepts which are separate from equilibrium, and then we'll also have constitutive concepts, things that connect motion to force. So let's look at maybe just one quick example to settle or make clear this concept of the internal force diagram. So I have, here I have a body, it's, we'll assume it to be deformable, and it's subjected to a 10 newton force uh, to the left on the end, and a 15 newton force someplace in the middle to the right. Okay, And let's go ahead and, and, and look at what the behavior of the system looks like from the perspective of an internal force diagram. So. If I make a section cut between the 15 and the 10 newton force, I'll draw in my reaction force R in the positive direction, so that word normal is in that direction there. And if I apply equilibrium to this body here, then I find that R is equal to minus 10 newtons for equilibrium. So that material is in compression at that point. If I make a section cut to the left of the 15 newton force, I'll draw in my unknown resultant in the positive direction, so the outward normal to the section cut is going in that direction. And if I apply equilibrium to this body, I find out that R is equal to 5 newtons. So we can make a plot of the system. So if we plot R of X versus X, we see that for any section cut between the end of the bar and the point where the 15 newton load is applied, I'm going to have compression of minus 10 newtons. And for all the points between the wall and the 15 newton force, I'm going to have an internal force of 5 newtons, and it's positive, so that's going to be in tension there. So, and this makes a big difference now. So if you have a material that is better in carrying compression but not in tension, then you would have to worry about the response or how much load there is between the wall and the 15 newton force. But if you had something the other way around, maybe you, you're worried about the material failing in compression, then you have to worry about the material between the 15 newton force and the 10 newton force. So this is just sort of a, a step towards looking at deformable bodies. But the internal force diagram is a very important concept. Um, and just keep in mind that the true behavior of the system when it's deformable is not given by, say, a statically equivalent version of the system. So this picture over here where I have a 5 newton load on the end of the bar, well that's statically equivalent to my 15 newton and 10 newton loads. But as far as a formal system is concerned, this is not going to give me the same behavior. So one has to be a little bit careful with the notion of statically equivalent force systems. Uh, so again, if I have this other picture here, where I put a fine newton force someplace along the middle of the bar is also statically equivalent. But again, it's going to uh, give very different behavior from the perspective of a deformable body.